Carlos Mila Point, and I'm very happy to be here today with uh, Bruno, Daniel, and you all uh, to have the opportunity to discuss uh, about what does it mean change in organization. So, uh, uh, professionally, I'm a UX uh, user experience professional. So, thank you very much. And I'm I'm starting. Uh, I'm going to introduce uh, or pass the microphone to my colleagues. Uh, first, uh, Bruno, uh, the mic is up to you. Thank you, Virginie. So I'm Bruno Coe, uh, and this is the first webinar actually of our new uh, webinar series, uh, Agile Leadership Bytes. Um, this this webinar is a bit special because we want to uh, explore with you an actionable transformation or leadership practice in only 30 minutes. So it's highly ambitious, pretty intense. Don't blink, as we say, and we really choose uh, uh, we choose some practice like the one today, six source of influence model that really provides huge leverage. So little effort for big benefits. And that's it. So I'll pass the, the, the microphone to my friend Daniel here. Yes. Um, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, wherever you may be. Uh, thank you, Virginie. Uh, thank you, Bruno. I'd just like to add that, you know, we're at an inflection point now where we've had 40 years of bumping up against systemic and social issues. And we realize that, you know, top down, um, although it's not something that most agile like to hear, top down is essential, but not in a command and control way. So we've put, we've we are now focusing our careers more on how do you change leadership mindset, leadership behaviors to move away from command and control, and allow true agency to emerge. So this is what part of what we'll be talking about today. So without further ado, let's get right into the material. Don't blink. Less than half an hour left. So first, some bad news to start this interesting topic. Actually, most organizations have been absolutely terrible at transformation and change. Okay, it's not just me saying, my claim is so it's credible, right? Um, and uh, this is why we choose this topic because most organizations are trying to transform, to evolve, and they are bad at it. So we hope that with this kind of small discussion here, we might hopefully uh, increase the, the score, maybe beyond, uh, above this, this uh, abysmal, 30%, okay. So um, to get back a bit on the webinar itself, the way we're going to work uh, today, it will basically have two parts. The first part, 20 minutes, around 20 minutes, Daniel and I are going to do most of the speaking with, with Virginie, going through the topic. And then the last 10-ish minutes, we're going to uh, address the questions and answers that you can write at any time uh, in the chat. Uh, we're going to go through three main, par three main parts, a short story, that's a real story, actually a real world story, and then we're going to use the six sources of influence model to answer two questions that are there on the screen. So uh, without further delay, let's dive into the topic. We start with a story because we want that to be very realistic and uh, it's a real world story. We named it, it's not personal, and I'm pretty sure you're going to uh, discover by yourself why we chose this title. So um, years ago, Daniel and I were uh, part of a transformation team in a large organization. And um, we, among other things, wanted to help a team of 15 business analysts to become more agile, like to produce their work progressively uh, as they develop product to discover things along the cycle. And unfortunately, they were completely at odds with that. They tried to understand everything up front. They want to do a huge analysis, uh, what is often called analysis paralysis. Of course, it hinders efficiency, creativity, innovation, you name it. So, of right. course, obviously, stop us if you've heard this one before. Right? <clears throat> Just kidding. Continue, Bruno. It's, very <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a classic story, right? It's a very familiar scenario. Right? You can replace business analysts by basically all right. kinds of team of functions you have met in the organization, right? That's why we chose this story also. And um, so we looked at each other and we said, let's send them all to, to agile training because we want them to become more agile. Then that, hmm, really, let's take a few seconds and maybe we meet with them. And then we met with three of them, three of these 15 business analysts to understand better what they were going through. So we asked them, um, why, uh, why are you producing all this upfront? Uh, is there a particular reason? And they said, uh, yeah, we know it's maybe not very optimal, you know, because indeed we write a lot of stuff that we know will be thrown away uh, very, very soon, even before the, the ink is dry, probably. 
Oh, okay. And what do you think about agility? Uh, yeah, I went to a course. He went. He read a book. We have a bit of experience. Oh, that's interesting. But if you if you if you know it's not optimal, and you have some skills, why why don't you do it differently then? Oh, oh, because you know there is uh, there are other reasons, right? It's not all cool. For example, there is the project management method. At gate two, we have to submit a, a 30, uh, 31 section business analysis in great details. If we don't do that, the project cannot move on and doesn't get its budget. Ah, interesting. And um, uh, and based on that, are there are there other elements? What will happen if you decide not to fill in this big document up front and try to convince them to do it differently? Ah, that would not be a good idea. We would be some uh, someone probably in front of the compliance committee, and uh, maybe even have a negative note for our performance evaluation. So definitely not a good idea. Oh, okay, interesting. And the twelve other people in the team, what do they think about that? Of changing the way of working? Oh, you know, some of them are very senior, a bit more conservative. When we talk about agility and doing things progressively, they look at us as if we're going to try to cut corners. You know, it's not really uh, very friendly. And on top of that, or our toolbox or big wiki, the best practices is all designed for predictive analysis uh, for, for when we know what we're going to do. So there's not much, not many tools there to uh, to use in an agile context. So Daniel and I, we looked at each other and we, we, we thought, oh, that was a good idea to interview them, right? Definitely. And we decided, why don't we try to have a tool to ask these kind of questions and explore the real causes of observable behaviors in a systematic way. And this is how we decided to uh, settle on the six sources of influence model. One thing that, in, you know, certainly in my early days as a, uh, a budding agilist back, back in the day, you know, I was quick to, I was quick to um, discount people as being, you know, anti-agile and anti-progress. And what's the matter with these people, right? And, you know, over the years, I've seen other agilists and other would be, would be coaches and, and would be you know scrum masters and so on come to the to the same conclusion rapidly losing faith in people uh, blaming it on the individual but the model we're going to show you it will help uh, those folks move away from that attribution error but continue Bruno I just wanted to throw that in because I felt it segued very well that's a very good point indeed it's exactly that and even experienced professionals make this mistake frequently you know, I've been guilty yeah me too. So uh, let's go look at this model. Um, so the first part of the model, first dimension, is the personal motivation, whether we want to do it or not, whether these business analysts, for example, want to try something new or not. But it's not just about wanting, it's also about the ability, so the skills and so on. Okay? Then there is the social part. I will hand it to Daniel there. Yeah, so it's one thing to be personally motivated to change your ways, one thing to be personally interested having the ability and motivation to move on. Um, but if there's no social motivation around you, so if you're the only one digging really fast and everybody's looking at the shovel, just leaning on their shovels going, hey, slow down. You're making the rest of us look bad, right? Uh, it gets old really fast. So social motivation, the social factors around you could be a demotivating aspect of changing ways of working. The same thing with uh, basically the next box, which is social ability. So even if other people sort of are lukewarm and sort of more open to the ideas than you thought, maybe they don't have the information. Maybe they're withholding the information. Maybe they just don't have the resources. The biggest resource being time. Everyone is strapped for time now more than ever. So maybe even if people are not against doing something or helping you doing something or helping the organization move forward, maybe they just don't have the resources and maybe they just aren't given the time. You know, a transformation or an evolution of the organization should not be an after school activity, right? Especially in the era of quiet quitting. You know, you shouldn't expect to, uh, you know, do agile transformation work during the day and get to your real job in the evening. You know, people have moved away from that since the pandemic and it was long overdue anyway. Then there is the, the third part of that, the structural part. So structural is what is beyond social, beyond the close colleagues, co-workers, stakeholders. It can be HR over there, 
or procurement over there? Basically, is there a stricter motivation? Uh, does, the, um, does the organization encourage this type of new behaviors? For example, is the reward system? And then finally, structural ability. Is the organization structured in a way that will support new behaviors in terms of, uh, of decision making, of teams, of functions, hierarchy, and so on? And these, uh, these six aspects together make up the model, which is very powerful. We've got motivation, ability, and we have personal, social, structural. So six sources of influence. It's really holistic, and we discovered that by using this kind of model, we often don't have any blind spots. You know? So um, let's have a look at how this model would have worked with our little story, little example. So this is the way to really understand how it works, right? So let's start. We thought that maybe they don't have the personal ability or motivation, these business analysts. So it turns out that actually they have some personal ability, they went to courses, and they would like to try something different. So they have some personal motivation, although not ideal. However, as the interview unfolded, we discovered that hmm, the project management process, corporate level, handled by the PMO out there, is this really something that's in the way? You know? And on top of that, if they do it differently, they might get in trouble. The organization not rewarding the right behaviors. Yeah, your projects come in great, but you uh, you don't follow the process to the letter, and that's an issue. So, remember how they mentioned that if they did it differently, they might be summoned in front of a compliance committee and be negatively evaluated. Daniel. Yeah. So then, with uh, social motivation, maybe team habits are uh, well. Uh, you know, we we'd like to create. Uh, a dashboard where people can pull the information but we don't have time we don't have the energy we don't have the data and it's you know even if we go back to the structure we're not going to get access to that data uh, so we you know we, we just got no motivation let's just carry on uh, in terms of uh, social ability right again maybe we don't have the right tools maybe we have we don't have the right knowledge maybe we haven't asked for the tools maybe we haven't asked to be you know to receive the proper training maybe it's everybody is sort of just nose to the grind and there's an aura of defeat and purposelessness so personal motivation and ability get crushed and people take on a mantle of invisibility and just wind up working to rule and doing the minimum and putting it setting aside their hopes for things ever changing but don't make the fundamental attribution error when you're first you know meeting people that you know, they don't have the motivation or the ability. In fact, you've probably seen this as well, but the transformations in the evolutionary ways of working that you have seen, have you ever noticed that once things, the ball starts rolling, people seem to come out of the woodwork and say, I've been for this all along. I've been saying this for years, finally someone's doing it, right? You know, all of a sudden there's, you know, everybody was always for it, but where were they when, you know, back when the, we were, you were trying to get this going? Well. They were crushed by social and structural issues. So don't blame the people. Blame the and system. I, right, right back to Deming. If I may add, uh, in a complex or in large organization in particular, uh, it is demonstrated that typically only 20% of observable behavior depends on the personal part. 80% are conditioned by the rest. This is why you can see people who change role, change team, change company, and suddenly they can be much more performant or effective or appreciated. It's the same person, same personality, same skills, same personality. The rest that is changing. So let's look at some potential ways to solve for this. So um, with Daniel, when we started using this model, we also asked ourselves, how can we systematize the use and uh, navigate through these different dimensions? And in particular, one good way of doing that is to ask the right questions. This question can be asked in an interview, like in our example, but also in a survey, online, or in a workshop. Ongoing matter, coaching, okay? one on ones. Doesn't exactly. matter the format, as long yes. as you're out there asking them as a leader. So we have examples here personal, for example, how would you be interested in trying this? How comfortable are you in this at the structural level? How ready is the organization for? Of course, these are very standard questions, but this, this can help readers to trigger the right discussion, the right conversation, and explore 
the, uh, the, the different dimensions. Daniel, would you how add would, something? How would your coworkers react if you uh, only filled in two paragraphs of that 37 page form and made them look bad because they're filling in the form? Why, you know, you know if, what would, if you challenge bureaucracy or if you were given the structural ability to challenge and root out useless bureaucracy? So asking these questions at every level in the organization and creating and disseminating this awareness and looking for these cues around social and structural impediments, um, it should not require a reckless act of courage to speak out. So obviously there's a minima of psychological safety that is required here. But not speaking out and not asking these questions, even in the most gentle and, and you know, uh, unobtrusive way, is a failure for rolling that rock back up the hill and watching it roll down and crush you and rolling the rock back up the hill and watching it roll down and crush you and everyone beneath it. So you got to have the courage to ask these questions as leaders. This is an example of question based on our example or little story. The previous ones were a bit more standardized here. Okay. If we take a, a question about structural ability, we want to make it more for the context of business analyst example, we could phrase it like that. How would the corporate processes, blah, 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 support this new way of, of doing business, business analysis? So we will elicit the kind of information we're looking for to really identify the root causes of the behaviors. And you don't have to boil the ocean in one fell swoop. You can find an ally here, an ally there, a comprehensive ear there, someone willing to try something there. So really, there are no process problems, and this is not news to this audience, right? We all know there are only people problems, but in the light of this framework, the interesting thing is, if you look at it this way, someone's social or structural problem ultimately really, really comes from someone else's personal influence somewhere. These are all people issues, right? The structure is not there. People are not there to serve the structure. The structure should be there to serve people. And somewhere within the organization, if there's a social or a systemic structure that is in the way of transformative, uh, in the way of the, of the organization thriving and become anti-fragile, uh, we have to find those people, get through to them somehow, um, make them allies or at least neutralize their, their influence. But that effort has to be made. Who is ultimately influencing variable X? Find out. Mm -hmm. If I may add, Daniel, to what you, you just mentioned, which is great, by the way, as usual, uh, we tend to blame like the system. Oh, it's all there. The system is not a magical entity. The system is made of people. If you look at our example, the project management process, it has been created by people. It is maintained by people. It evolved with people. It is enforced by people. So in the end, if you want to change that, it's not just me, Bruno, and Daniel going there and changing it. You've got to work with the same kind of tool with the people who are, for example, responsible of the PMO. And we move upstream in the, 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 the source of influence. So let's look at some concrete strategies besides, hey, go talk to people. <laughs> yeah, so very quickly because I see that the, the, the time is uh, yeah. of the essence today, right? So based on that, once we have the answer, we can identify the, the, the root cause of behaviors. We have different types of strategies we can use very quickly. For example, personal motivation, we want to make the undesirable desirable. We can develop self-awareness to understand what's important, why it's important for me. Engage with a vision, so we, we project people and they can engage in the, the transformation, for example. Um, personal ability, of course, there is the training, which is like the magic bullet people believe usually, but also experiments if you want to learn. You want to be, you need to be open to make mistakes. So you need some space for that. Daniel, for the social part? On the, yeah, on the social part, I like to, you know, challenging social norms, you know, getting opinion leaders to walk the talk. <clears throat> Again, that's talking to people and that's basically finding who is willing. You know, there's always someone in, 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 in the leadership, in the leadership zone who is willing to, to, to walk their talk. Um, one thing you can also do even as a team is data bring data to the table so i was recently working with um, with one organization where i encouraged them to systematically quantify with data from their systems the cost of invisible work all right invisible work being anything that is not documented 
either in a project plan, a program plan, or a, a national backlog. All the little things that add up. No invisible work. Well, if you're choking in invisible work, quantify it, right? You have to use, sometimes you have to use the system's own methods of reckoning in order to get a seat at the table. And obviously we mentioned allyship, seek the support of enablers, right? And all this challenge, you know, you, you have to commodify dissent. Dissent should be basically almost become a norm. Dissent, but constructive dissent, constructive criticism. Uh, make that slowly but surely, uh, make that acceptable. Not, not possible everywhere. If it's not possible, you know, there's so many choices today that if you're banging your head against the wall, you can also take set, you know, uh, um, the advice of the author of Dip, I keep wanting to say, is it, it's uh, Seth something, I can't remember now, I'm getting old, but so basically, you know, use the law of two feet, change company. It might come to that uh, as a last resort. And then the structural stuff, we're going to get back to that. Yeah, very quickly on this one, we already mentioned it. Structural motivation, how does the organization really uh, reward the right uh, behaviors? It's not just here monetary rewards. So, so if you have a role, is it part of your title? Can you be proud of it? If an, a job is, is as, can I be proud of that? Or is it something that I do uh, Friday afternoon, I have to hide it because people will look down on me, okay? Uh, redesign the organization, structural ability, that's a bit deeper. Can change titles, can change high core levels, can restructure teams. Uh, it can also be the physical environment, huh? how you structure the office, for example. Uh, so all these are examples of, I would say, a, a start of the strategies we can do to laser focus on the causes we discover in the previous step. So to finish on our uh, PowerPoint slide here, okay, I see that uh, we've got a bit uh, over, uh, over the time limit. Just uh, one word on this. This, this tool, the six sources of influence model, is highly versatile. You can use it for yourself even, for your team, for influence work. I use it, for example, to help a PMO move from a compliance posture to an enabler posture. You can use it at a complete organization level. So it's, it's highly versatile in, in uh, its application domain, I would say. So now uh, I suggest that for the time left, we uh, would take a couple of questions, maybe. Virginia? Yes, uh, thank you so much. So uh, we had one question from Michel, uh, which is how can we improve transparency and trust in an organization? In my experience, it is essential to create a flowing model. Uh, so uh, I would like, if you will, uh, if, you, if you're okay, I would just like to provide part of the answer from my perspective. Um, what I've seen is that uh, one key component, one key mechanism that is uh, essential uh, as a starting point is putting in place the communication mechanism. So um, um, transversal communication uh, in, in, in the organization as well as upstream and downstream to make sure that it's transparent in different uh, organizational tools, uh, collaborative tools in order for everyone to uh, being able to see the evolution uh, of the organizational intentions uh, through objectives, uh, changes in perspective from the, the direction, but also for the leaders to understand where the team stand and, and to create that momentum and that sense of belonging all uh, across the organization. So that would be my take in terms of what does it take to, uh, let's say, mobilize and provide transparency. Absolutely. Um, so that's part of what you're talking about, Virginie, is a you know a pull a pull model for information and data, so we don't have to have multiple meetings to share the same information. Um, what I have found also is that modeling vulnerability and leadership being able to say, "I don't know," and not pretending to have all the answers, will elicit far more exchange and true exchange on, on any subject than saying, okay, I looked at the data and this is what's wrong. If a leader starts, says something like that, it's game over. You've just shut everybody down, right? So I've looked at the data. I'm puzzled. How can we 
interpret this together for moving forward. But not every leader has reached the stage of you know, you know, catalyst behavior that allows them to do that. But we have to hold those leaders who don't to account and encourage them to. I like to emphasize also that the tool we're showing here today uh, as the human values at its core, you see, because it really looks at what are the real causes without trying to attribute the mistake to people and make this transparency. Uh, it actually provides natural transparency in the sense that we see, we, ex we make explicit where the influences come in terms of behaviors. So we can act on that. So it's a tool that will also uh, create a lot of, of, uh, of well being in the organization. So thanks a lot. I hope you liked it. You can always ask your questions. Most of us are linked on LinkedIn. Otherwise, look us up and fire away with the questions you would have liked to debate. We're open for the next discussion. Please reach out anytime. Thank you so much, everyone.